Farmer to Farmer Five live stream here in Omaha, Nebraska, or as I like to think of it, the Saramac Canada Apology Tour. I do love the country of Canada, and I've proven it by bringing you two Canadian farmers here to join us today. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. All right, I'm Scott McKinnon. We're from uh, Central East Central Alberta, Canada. We've got a uh, roughly 8,000 acre mixed grain operation and about a 350 head beef operation. That's kind of what keeps us busy and three little girls who are all in 4-H hockey, dance, baseball and everything else. Real people, real family. Hockey in it. Canada. Just a little bit. I'm shocked. <laughs> Beef in Canada. Grain in Canada. It's okay. amazing. Yeah. We, our penguin farm is downsized. So. Okay, okay. It's hard to farm around the igloos. <laughs> so we have to ask, I think, the question that everyone will be wondering, which is, why are you here? I asked myself that this morning too. Um, so anyways, my name is Robert Semnick. I farm in Smoky Lake, which is Northeast Alberta. Um, 4,700 acre grain farm, straight grain. Um, two kids, same thing as Scott, very busy, very busy life. Um, we are here to learn. Learn from our, our American neighbors, um, be part of the group, the FBN family. I'm assuming we're calling it a family. A family and network, you can call it whatever you want. It's right. awesome. Yeah. That's what I call it. Okay. Yep. So I have a very controversial question for you, which is Canada, 51st state? Of? America. <laughs> <laughs> that answers that. That answers that, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we heard from our last guest that it's been a bit of a challenging year in Canada. I think farmers in America might be able to understand a little bit about that. What happened in 2019? Oh, everything. Um, I mean, from trade issues to weather, weather probably being the biggest issue. Um, and it was coast to coast. Um, my wife and I were just at a conference that um, has farmers from across the country. And it was coast to coast. I've never seen such a, a tired group of farmers ever um, after a season that we went through. And I think, I think it, it fell right into the US also. It was just, everybody was just burnt out. I mean, the weather just did not cooperate when it came time to take the crop off. Zach, what a... So as a, as a wonderful winter getaway, after that's all over, you came to beautiful Omaha, Nebraska. There's less snow than home, so Con that was okay. Considerably less? Yeah, but it's colder, so it's colder I than wasn't happy about that. I wow. never travel south to get colder, so I'm not sure what happened. That's surprising. When Randy and I drove down yesterday, we lost 28 degrees in a six hour drive south. Wow. Yeah, so it's tropical here. <laughs> Listen, I'm continually plugging Farmer to Farmer 6, Cancun, Mexico. Oh, I think you you're won, you won right there. there Where's go. the bells? You should start a petition. <laughs> I think you should. Yeah. yeah. There we go. So we're here. There's going to be lots of conversations amongst farmers, between farmers, as they kind of are getting in the groove of 2020. What are you guys going to be talking? I mean, Let's let's get right into the controversy. Is there anything that you can learn from American farmers, or are Canadian farmers just better? <laughs> Scott, <laughs> apology tour 2019. Uh, one of the best things about coming to these kind of events is to meet other farmers and hear what they've gone through. Everybody, we've all got our our strengths and weaknesses, but when we get to sit with other farmers, it doesn't matter if you're growing corn or soybeans or wheat. So many of the things that you can learn about so many of the problems we have are very similar. And the successful farmers or businessmen, business people, always seem to have the same theme. They've gone through adversity and they've come out stronger and smarter and more motivated again. So for us, that's a big reason why we're here. Have you guys been here before? Not, not this no, one. This no, is the first, no, time, this first is one you've been to. Yeah. It's fun. We actually this is a really fun show. Our marketing advisor was with us for years before and then when he came on with you, he brought us along. So this is brand new to us, but we're just trying to learn. Yeah. Marketing was our main, our main outlet before that we didn't think we could handle properly. And with all the things going on in the world, that's just one less thing to have to worry about. So that's what we started with. And now we're just learning over the years as things have gotten bigger that you can't do it all yourself. You have, yeah. to, you have to get, you know, uh, outsource those things to people who are better, more connected and more passionate about it. So, so why would you guys, I'm curious to each of you, why did you become members and what do you like the most now after being members for a while? What do you like most about being a member of FBM? Well, yeah, I mean, we came on with the marketing side. Um, I was aware of, of some of the things that FBN was doing. 
Um, the price discovery was definitely one of them. Um, some of the uh, um, products that were available. In Canada, we don't have nearly the, the product list that there's the American farmer, but it's growing and-, and Even with all the, the diverse crops up there, you have less of a, you'd say, of a product list? It's, it's getting them registered in Canada ah. under the FBN label. Sure. Which is all, it's, it's a process, especially in Canada. It tends a to be process a process or a process? Did I say Canadian maybe? Yeah, or? you said it, I think that was a Canadian word. Okay. How should we say? Process, process. Well, you're from Canada, so you got to say process. It, it's my job to just to, give you some crap. Right. The, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so process. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 growing and evolving, and it's exciting to see and be a part of, of what's what's going to be happening. Um, especially the fact that we we have the ability to see how it's going in the U.S. and and it seems that it's really really helping the American farmer quite a bit. So I'm excited to be a part of that. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Scott? Yeah, we're really new to this, to FBN, but we've been, like I say, with the marketing side of it, we've been sold on that. And having a team atmosphere on our farm um, in a similar situation, but not, not everybody on the same company. We've done that for years. Probably one of the first growers in our area to just finally really give in and say, you know, we're going to hire agronomy out, we're going we're gonna to outsource marketing. Um, and the other parts of it, they just make a lot of sense. So sure, you just, you can't do it all that well and it's nice to have that the, the team behind you you know that has your back when things when things go really tough in other places like this year's harvest the last thing you can be thinking about is marketing when you're trying to get a crop off in the mud or the snow so it right it, even if it's just for your mental health to have to have that team behind you and almost every year it pays you know, in the long run it, it does so. I don't know if you guys are aware of this I recently dated something in 2011 but it turns out it's 2019 December which means it's almost 2020, which is insane. There's a whole new decade that's about to happen. Give me a little outlook and Zach chime in because really isn't Minnesota just Canada light? What do the next 10 years on your guys' farms look like? I'm still hung up on the Canada light thing. So <laughs> you go ahead and take this. <laughs> um, I think it's just bigger, badder, better. I think that's just, just the way the trend is going. Um, uh, farms are amalgamating. I would imagine after these tougher years, you're going to see probably more amalgamation, maybe even faster than normal. Um, and I think it's it's just the trend. And and as we have tools like FBN and our marketing people and stuff like that, I think that's it's all fitting together. I think it's all it's all gonna gonna happen. Um, I think we're still probably going to maintain the family farm. I think that's I don't think that's ever going away, um, and I think it's still going to be the majority of it. But uh, it's it's going to get bigger, more intense, um, and harder to manage. So, Scott, I'm actually hoping, you know, and, and naive enough to hope that this can still happen. But we we grew our farm really quickly over a lot. Well, it seemed like very quickly. And now I'm trying to raise a family, and I've realized that. And I think as farmers, it's it's kind of a there's a this last year there's been a bit of a, a, a an awakening to it is how stressed and how hard working farmers are, and. I've just realized, you know, I've worked these crazy hours all these years and to build the place. Then you look back and realize, I'm not even raising my kids anymore. You know, we're, when we need to keep the farm going, but how can we, you can't just keep going down that path. And, and farmers probably are almost, everybody has some little aspect of them that's almost superhuman, whatever it is that you do really well. And we've all focused in and done that. And, and we're actually looking at, I'm hoping our farms to some extent quit growing at the pace they are. And, and we can keep our acreage similar maybe without having to just keep exponentially growing to make a profit. It'd be like, you know, say our, our, our Canadian dairy industry, it's a different thing, but those guys can make a living with a smaller amount of cattle. No, it's a totally different industry. But I, I, don't, I don't foresee wanting to have these huge farms that our children won't be able to manage because as you grow into it, you learn how to manage it. But if you hand that off to somebody else, it's there's no even interest in them wanting to do it. So I'm trying to find a way to keep our farm from having to just keep growing just for the sake of growth and make a really good living and maybe branch it out into a few different ventures that maybe one of my kids might want to take part in and, and diversify it that way. And I'm sure the farm will still keep growing, but I don't want to see 50,000 acre farms all over the place and nobody else. So yeah. we're looking at ways to just, you know, it was always a, sustainability has been a big catchphrase lately, but it's not just that just for the sake of saying it but what can we do to just make a better living and have a more balanced life and, and these kind of things tie into that very well we don't want to just sustain we yeah. want to you know flourish right yeah. sustain is just yeah and people say that 
farmers are always trying to look after things. So we've always right. done that anyway. Before that was a catchphrase, but yeah, that's that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's a, an interesting way to look at it. I think, personally, I think going at, going forward, like you said, you don't think the family farms will go away. I, I, I would agree. I think there's always, especially going forward, going to continue to be a place for the smaller farms and a place for the bigger farms. And I think the consumer is really going to drive a lot of that because the consumers are really kind of branching off and demanding their own things, right? So I think there's going to be a market for what the small farmer can do and a market for where the bigger farmer is, is more efficient, right? And it just a place for everybody. I really think, um, I really believe that going forward that, that that's probably what we're looking at. I hope that's what we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, there's no reason that all farms can't exist and shouldn't be able to exist. Right. And I agree with that. And one farm could be a, you know, we're a wheat, canola, barley, oats, peas, commodity producer, but we could be a niche uh, beef producer or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And every farm can, and if you have a, a per, uh, an employee or a kid that comes back to the farm with a specialty, we always try and build on that, whatever that may be. Right. And, and let that person take something and, and do their own because you can't just keep plodding away with the same two crops. And I, and I see in the American farmers get cornered sometimes with that with say two major crops and it gets really tough competitively if it doesn't work out. Right. You're, you're, you're kind of pigeonholed there. So I think the Canadian farms and the ones we're around are set up okay that way, but it also is a lot more risk and a lot more management to deal with. Sure. You know, so. Yeah, I think there's a real through line there among farmers that I know too. I about kind of that work-life balance element, I hear that so much because the thing that farmers have that a lot of other people don't is your kids are watching you not have a work-life balance. They're there every day. And so when you, you know, you want your kids to come back and take over the farm, why would they? They've seen you yeah. struggle. They've seen you never be around. And I think I see farmers trying to find that balance of, you know, do, do I need to hire someone? Do I need, how, how can I align my business to have the life I want that I, can feel confident handing that off to my child that I want that for future generations. We've changed when I grew up as a little guy, it was almost a badge of honor to be really busy and work really hard and, mm -hmm. and, and we've and everybody who's in this business has always proved has obviously proved themselves now. But my wife told me about a year ago, she said, our kids, we had a real conversation. It was like our kids are watching you do exactly what you said and work your butt off and come home grouchy about this or that. You don't even know you're doing it. And they don't really see the, the benefit of the, the gratification of finishing the job or whatever that I get to see. And she said, if, if this doesn't change, they're not gonna want to have anything to do with that. And I didn't even, it really struck home for me, right? So mm -hmm. I'm stepping back, and maybe that's just my midlife crisis, just stepping back and trying to say, okay, how can we make this better without, and have a better work-life balance for everybody, but still maintain that peak performance? Because you have to do that. There, right. You can't just slack off, the industry will just run you over. You have yeah. to still perform, mm -hmm. but how can we perform how can we do that and still and, and, and live a life that our that our kids will accept? Yeah, and our employees will accept. So. It's so hard because you know that you, it's like there's a part of you that's like I could do it though, and I want it I, because I can do it. I'm gonna do it, or I want to do it. Done it before. It. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. and it's hard to identify moments where you can be like I can do it, but I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, and that's like for me, and that's for my family, and that's. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the better management that I think you're seeing the farms and going into the future. That's what they are. They're just, they are, they are still family farms, but the management level is, is increasing in the U.S. and Canada, both um, exponentially. It's just crazy how, how much more management's going into it. And, and that's where your work-life balance comes into, into play, too, because you, you recognize shortfalls that you're, you're creating and, and stuff like that. So it, um, I still think it's, it's, it's still going to be going up. Absolutely. It's a great, oh, great way to look at it. Um, I'm interested, what are you guys most looking forward to at this show? Is there a poutine bar? There should be. <laughs> right next to so our maple cookies. There's definitely a bar. Right beside the maple cookies. <laughs> yes. And the moose. Is the and, moose here? And the barbecued hockey pucks. And the barbecued hockey yeah. pucks. That makes nothing but sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, I, we actually talked about it just a minute ago. It's the network, right? It's the networking ability here. Is that is is that I, I think we're both of us are on the same page yeah, as far you'll meet, as that we'll meet some incredible people yeah. here just we need to chance. network because it's 50 percent of canada right here so <laughs> this is this is half this of you? is half sure. of us yeah yeah, yeah. You, you, and yeah. justin trudeau was and, the fourth one and just no no, 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 no we, we shouldn't talk about that religion or politics yeah we specifically said nothing about religion or politics to put put my life in perspective 
we got into the hotel last night at midnight, had to get up before four this morning to get on the plane. And Candice and I said, like, God, we could just tell everybody we went and just sleep for four days in the hotel and just, and like, that's really probably half people here are You're that tired. You're an out-of-the-box thinker. They're that tired, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to get out and do this stuff, but I'm really looking forward to just meeting some energetic people, coming back home with a little bit more mm -hmm. fire under my tail. Yeah. Well, Definitely. luckily, we will all have the chance to sleep in like three days. But until then, we're going to stay so wired, so awake, so excited to be here at Farmer to Farmer. Uh, we actually have a couple of people we know that you're watching out there on the live stream. We want to say hi to Preston in Nebraska, also Sam K in Missouri, and Harvlin C from Texas. We know you're out there. We see you. We appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be right back after this.